Hi, Jim here, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. This week, I'm speaking to television actress Corinne Wicks. Corinne shot to fame in BBC One's flagship drama Doctors, playing Dr Helen Thompson for over five years. She then went on to appear as Ella Hart in ITV's primetime soap, Emma Dale, receiving two Best Actress nominations during her time on the show. Corinne has also appeared in two films that I've directed, You Might Get Lost and The Apocalypse Box. And with The Apocalypse Box coming out in August, it's out now, so you can watch it right now. I'll put a link in the description. I wanted to talk to Corinne about her incredible career, but also about what it was like working on those feature films to give you a bit of an insight behind the scenes. Enjoy. So let's go back in time now, start of your career. Yeah. Um, so you went to drama school, is that right? Acting school? I did go to drama school. Yeah. Uh, but I, went, I went late. Um, I'd already had a career in casting for, for many years. Always wanted to be an actress, um, but mm-hmm. was terribly shy. I still am very shy, um, but cripplingly shy. I was brought up to be seen and not heard and preferably not even heard. Um, so um, I, I never, I did do a few school plays, um, which I don't know how I found the courage to do really, because I didn't really, I, I was a very quiet person at school. I didn't have many friends. Um, Certainly not until I got to the sixth form uh, and then I kind of flourished a bit. But it was, I always, always wanted to be an actress, I think because I had a TV in my in my room um, and that's what I did. I used to watch, you know, TV all the time, uh, a bit like that now. Um, so I, where this ambition came from, I don't know. I don't come from a, a theatrical family in any way, shape or form. Um, so it took me a long time to get round to doing it. I worked in the box office at the local theatre and then worked my up, way up um, to be the assistant of the uh, artistic director there. And then I took over the casting role and then I moved into TV casting. Yada, yada, yada. And then by the time I was, I was 26. No, I tell a lie. That was my, that's my, I used to lie about my age all the time. I was actually, I would, be, <laughs> I would have been 28 when I made the decision to go. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was lying by the pool in Crete with my mum and my sister. We'd gone on our first ever abroad holiday. I was lying by the pool, and I said to myself, okay, you you can apply to one drama school. You won't get in because you've got no talent, no experience, no nothing. Um, Can't tell anybody because it's going to be so embarrassing, you know, if I let people know and I don't get in. But then I can put this to bed, and I can focus on my career as a casting director because the... The casting director I worked for at the time, Doreen Jones, we worked on big things like Prime Suspect and DLM Pasco and films and things. Uh, Bless her, she's she's dead now, so she's no use to me anymore. Uh, But Mm. anyway, um, she was talking about sort of handing over the reins to me. And um, I, I, I was getting more and more jealous of people that were coming in who were younger than me because I started when I was quite young and that was fine when older people were coming in, but when younger mm. people started coming in for jobs and, and I thought, well, if they can do it, you know, I was getting really jealous and I thought, I can't put my heart and soul into um, uh, casting people that I'm actually <laughs> really jealous of. Um, so I applied for one drama school. Um, my then boyfriend was uh, a, an actor um, and he'd been to Weber Douglas and the two schools at the time that I really liked were Weber Douglas and Lambda. Because as a casting director, I used to go to see um, the student shows all the time. And at that time, those were the two schools that I thought were the best. Now, Doreen, my boss, was on the board of Lambda. So there was no way I could apply, could apply there because she would know. Um, so I just applied to Weber Douglas. And I learned some pieces with the, um, with the help of my then boyfriend, Ian. And got in. So then I had to hand my notice in in six months time. I had to give six months notice rather. So I left it till the last hour, literally. I sat there and Doreen said, aren't you going home? And and then I just blurted out, Doreen, I'm leaving, I'm going to drama school. To which she said, fucking hell. <laughs> um, she couldn't believe it. She pulled all the other cast and directors in and said, can you believe what this moron is doing? She's going to drama school. Why the hell would she do that? And they also just saw me, I was very shy still even then and quiet. And and I just, I think they probably thought she's never gonna, never gonna work. Mm. Um, 
anyway, I did. I was lucky and I was very lucky and got a few um, small telly jobs in the first week I left drama school. And then I think within the year I got doctors, um, mm. which was actually what a stroke of luck. I mean, I didn't know it was daytime at the time. None of us knew it was daytime. Um, it was a new uh, BBC drama um, about, it was called The Practice at the time, um, about a, a medical practice. And to be given a lead in that with with so little experience um, was incredible. And I thought that set me up for the rest of my life. And this is what it's going to be like. You know, I'm going to go from job to job. I'm going to just go up, 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 up. Um, and that didn't happen. <laughs> but I had I had five and a half fantastic years on it. Um, I, I loved every moment of it. I love being busy. I'm such a lazy moo in real life. I, I either do nothing, and I mean nothing. I lie in bed all day watching TV. Or mm. I'm the complete opposite. If I've got a job and I've got a purpose, then I put everything into it. And I, I love that. So I see it as reserving, preserving my energies for when the job comes up. So at the moment, I'm in one of those resting yeah. phases. Actually, um, oh, you're in a resting I mean, this, well, got, this is my nighty I've got one, but I thought I can get away with oh, that. Oh, nice. But I actually have told you now, I'm actually in my nighty. Um, but I did brush my in hair. In nighty, doing the podcast. Yeah. Yep. That's lovely. Well done. Um, the so then, all right. So so talking about doctors. Yeah. So how often was that on? Because for people who don't know, younger audience, how yeah. often was doctors on telly? D doctors was on at lunchtime every day. Um, every, every day. Wow, yes it was on every day mm -hmm. so how often were you f were you filming every single day over those five years yes I mean we don't obviously if you weren't featuring in in a, an episode much um or it was your major mm. story and then you you might have the odd day off or half day off we did have weekends off at the time we occasionally filmed weekends but we had a couple of units running when it first started it was a three-month contract um, and we didn't know it was going to be um, recommissioned and then eventually become what was known as a soap. Um, and that was mm. because Mal Young, the producer, um, was very adamant that it's not soap. It's a continuing drama. Don't ever call it a soap. It is not. And then about a year later, when the soap awards started, he suddenly decided, no, we're going to rebrand. We are going to be a soap now so we can get awards in the soap. <laughs> so that therefore we became a soap. Yeah. And although um, I think, uh, I believe it, it came off for a few weeks at Christmas off the TV and um, for the summer holidays, it, it w wasn't on air. But nevertheless, we were still filming. Um, so, yeah, we filmed mm. year round um, and, um, you know, it could be flat out. And we had, uh, I think it was, I think it was three or, or four units filming at the same time. So you, you had, mm. maybe it was three, I think we had 12 scripts that you had to have under your belt all the time because you could be slipping from from episode one to episode 11 and then back to episode four and you know etc um but I thrive on I love that I love being busy you know Jim you know what I was like with the um with you might get lost uh you know just mm. referencing where I am and what I'm wearing and you know just all of that preparation and note taking and uh, I, I love I love that I love being um yeah completely immersed and be, being on top of things um so, yeah so doctors was, was good training for for that really um because although we had obviously continuity and costume and everything they had so many characters and so many episodes as well to carry around in their heads i used to always make notes on my script you know which side my bag was um how I, which hand i used to exit the door with whatever so that when we picked up the other side of that door, maybe two weeks later, um, I would remember. And so very often mm. I would question the continuity people um, and say, are you sure? Because I've written down this. And sometimes, obviously, I would be wrong, but not very often. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I'm a megalomaniac as well. I just like, you know, I like the power. Yeah. Anyway, so, so yes, it was a very happy job. And I got to meet Tom, my husband. Um, yeah. Tom Butcher. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, so that was another good thing. And lifelong friends as well. I mean, Christopher Timothy rang me the other day. Um, we keep in touch. And, and uh, actually, most of the cast I keep in touch with. Um, but they're showing, a little plug, they're showing uh, Doctors from the beginning on 
UK TV drama. I think actually oh, it's, nice. been, it's been on for a little while now. So I think they're already up to about year four. I was in year one until mm -hmm. 2000 and end of 2005. So you better start mm. watching now. So that must have been, what was that like when you first started that gig? So you get there, you get plopped into a lead role on this big mm. show and you've got all these lines. Like what's, what was day one like? Do you remember it? Yes, I do. Well, actually, day one, day one was the, was January the 11th, 2000. And I remember that because it was the uh, just before my birthday. And mm. uh, I'm, I'm dyslexic, um, not hugely dyslexic. I have good days and bad days, but read throughs terrify me. Just having words in front of me, even if I've learned them, it, yeah, it's just uh, I, I go into panics. And I hadn't actually done a, a read through before because I, before that I'd only played small parts. So we did a read through of the first three episodes in Pebble Mill, and then I made some excuse to. I was just so embarrassed. I was just, I, I was just awful, and I left straight away. And a few weeks later, Mal Young, the producer at the time, uh, we got quite friendly, and he told me, you know, I almost sacked you after the read through because you would. I've made tons of notes and they were all about you and how bad you were mm. it said but luckily you left which was the best decision you could have done because you left straight away before I could say anything and I gave you the benefit of the doubt and thank god I did because now I see the rushes you know I I absolutely made the right choice to give you the job so so that mm. was good uh, so I, I clung on by the skin of my teeth after the the read-through um so I remember that very clearly and then day one, it was, we were filming, it was a big um, reception scene. And everybody else in it, even the, there were two girls in it playing the nurse and the receptionist who were younger than me. Um, but they had so much more experience. Literally, I was kind of fresh out of drama school. And I was with all these experienced people. And I was terrified. And I thought, my line's coming up, my line's coming up. And uh, I had to, I wrote it down. I stuck it on I stuck it on the reception so I could read because I was just so terrified. Um, yeah, that was one of the scariest days of my life, I think, that, that first day. And then once that first line was out, I, it, it was plain sailing after that. And the crew and everybody were just so supportive and wonderful. It was a new thing for all of us. We were embarking on this journey together. And, uh, you know, it really was a joyous time and um, fantastic, talented people. It all went downhill when I left. I mean, you know, it's, it's oh yeah, it's been it's <laughs> now, and um, I, you know, actually, funnily enough, I got a lovely message from somebody on social media the other day saying, "I cannot believe how good doctors used to be." I've been watching the the original ones on UK TV drama, mm. um, and he said, "I can't believe how how good it was in the old days," and it really was. I I think. Um, I mean, obviously, we had you know some iffy iffy um, storylines, some iffy performances, whatever. But on the whole, I think it was a really good, ex you know, it, it was, it was um, yeah, just a good good programme, I think. Um, very popular. Mm, we, used mm. get, we used to get, I think, about between three and four million, which was a huge amount of viewers at, at, at that time for that time slot as well. And a load of mm. students. Um, loads of students and older people obviously but loads of students and I've subsequently met a few people that have stopped me in the street and one one lady that wrote to me when I was in it and I wrote back she was going through a very tough time as a kid and we corresponded for a little while and then she subsequently co contacted me a couple of years ago on social media and we've been corresponding since but anyway she became a nurse because of um, watching me in doctors and somebody just a, uh, about two years ago, stopped me on Old Compton Street at this guy and said, oh, my God, it's you. You made me want to be a doctor. And now he is. He, he, he went and trained and he's a doctor. And so, so that's nice. Um, so I was obviously a mm. little convincing, even though I'm a complete and utter wimp in real life. And I faint when I have a blood test. Um, but I was obviously convincing enough as, as a doctor. So, so yeah. there you go. I'm sure you were. I'm sure you were. Um, so then for people who are new to acting, mm -hmm. obviously you had to learn a lot of, lot of lines. Like I've seen you on set. You always, it's very rare that you flub a line and you get very, I've seen you, you get very annoyed with yourself when you do. Oh. 
Um, so you, very rare you flub a line. So what is your technique for remembering all those lines? I think partly because I, I have um, reading problems. You know, I have to be pretty solid on lines. And it does become a habit. I mean, with something like Doctors, and, and I also was in Emmerdale um, for a year as well. Um, and so, you know, you do... It, when you're learning lines daily, you know, you kind of pick them up. It, it becomes a habit. And you and it's like a, mm. anything. It's like a muscle. If you use it, you know, it, it, you, you get better. Um, but I think, yeah, re repeating it to myself. Um, yeah, repetition, repetition. Um, but you're right. I mean, sometimes I can't get my math to work and I get so annoyed. My my language is, uh, yeah, the air turns blue when I, I get things wrong. I think you're very generous. I do fluff a lot of lines. But the thing is, I know them. I just can't say them. Um, but, uh, which is a different issue altogether. But, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think just repetition. And some people have a terrible time learning lines. Uh, mm. you know, touch wood um I, I, it tends to be more easy for me perhaps because i've had all that experience in the past but then you know i haven't been in that situation for a while so um so who knows um i hope i'd still have the knack um for for line retention but it is also um very different uh doing screen work rather than stage because obviously screen work mm. you do it for a few takes and then you throw it away in your head um obviously with stage work you've got to retain it for for weeks sometimes months and i've done quite a few tours that have gone on for months and actually gone back and done them for a couple of years um running um and that's a different thing they, then they go into your long-term memory um but yeah really i don't think i have any techniques but just learning a bit a bit at a time learn a page at a time uh, and then mm. go go back over that also, um, I tend to, if I'm driving to location or if I'm on tour or whatever, I will um, run it through in my head and actually speak my my lines. Because after a while, you get to know what your cues are as well. But also another handy technique, which Tom does too sometimes, and I started doing it when I was at drama school, is recording everybody else's lines and leaving a gap. Um, and then you play mm. them back and then you say, and that's a really useful technique, I think to do um yeah those those are my top tips as useful as they are that's fine that's good it's good some useful tips there i would not be good at memory memorizing lines and i've got to say i don't know if this is genius casting but on the mm. apocalypse box i don't think we had anyone who fluffed their lines regularly um which could have been that could have gone horrifically wrong when you've got 10 actors yeah. in one room and you're doing these long takes and, you know, time is of the essence. So, yeah, I don't think anyone was uh, Actually, bad at that. It was really good. Yeah, that would have been a nightmare in those big group scenes, like you say. You know, But also, if you're the one then with a big group scene, a big setup, and you're the one that fluffs. Mm. Oh, God, that's mm. just... That's just terrible. And, and actually, going back to doctors and my early experiences, I think part of the nerves were then that you're aware of how expensive, you know, it, the, the time is um and yeah. it takes a while for you to relax and i think the best thing is when you see other actors who are more experienced than you fluffing that's the best thing to put everybody at ease mm. um when you see them mess up you think oh so it's okay i don't have to be perfect um yeah oh, obviously i am perfect so you know it's but yeah. but it's yeah. <laughs> but um but you know you don't have to it's okay just relax just yeah just relax that's the that's um that's a trick in itself isn't it so then let's talk about emma dale so i I've, obviously i do my normal stalking googling yeah and i'm not a big soap fan but i, no. I searched up ella hart sexy and savvy someone had put young young naughtier joan collins um oh. so yeah it's good that's a compliment so yeah. tell me how did you end up working on emma dale and mm -hmm. what was that experience like I auditioned for Emmerdale. I actually, um, there was a wonderful producer called Gavin Blythe, who was uh, the producer of Emmerdale at the time. Um, 
And I, like you, I'm not actually a, a soap watcher apart from EastEnders. I've been an EastEnders fan ever since right, right back to when it started. Um, and it's the only one. Obviously, I don't watch it all the time, but I, you know, I, I pretty much follow it the whole time. Uh, and it's the only one of the soaps I haven't done. I've done all of the others. Um, but uh, anyway, I, uh, so Emmerdale, I uh, just got a, an audition for. And I th Gavin already, he'd met me at the Soap Awards, I believe, um, for, for Doctors a, a, a while before that. Um, and so I just got this audition. And actually, when I turned out, I had to go to Leeds um, and I did a screen test straight away. Um, I subsequently found out they'd seen a few other people that hadn't found who they wanted. And so I kind of bypassed all the early auditions and just went straight for a screen test with Chris Bisson. Um, because my character was was the ex-wife of Jason Merrill's, but Jason wasn't available that day. I think he was on set or he was on holiday or whatever. Chris Bisson was um, somebody that my character was meant to have had a, um, a relationship a, a while before. And um, mm. so he read in. Um, so we were on set and I did a couple of scenes with him on set and we acted them out and it was on camera. Um, and it was really good fun, actually. And, and uh, I had a chat with Gavin, who was adorable, a lovely, lovely guy. Um, and... Then I went on holiday with um, down to Weymouth with my mum and dad. Um, and I think Tom joined us as well, actually. But we were staying in the caravan and dad was driving us back from somewhere along a country lane. And I got a call from my agent just saying, you've got it. I, and I, I shouted at my dad to pull over, pull over. And dad said, what, what? <laughs> He you know, slammed on the brakes and pulled over because I was worried because we were in the country that I was going to lose the signal. And uh, yeah, I got I, I got it. So that was quite incredible to just have one one audition for it. Um, so uh, I cribbed up on it a bit, watched it a bit before, so I knew who people were. Um, and yeah, I'd, and and just went in uh, at the deep end, and um, it was fantastic. She was a lovely character, um, but very very sadly, about three months after I joined. Gavin went off sick and I think they thought it was um, glandular fever or something at the time and the doctors couldn't really find out what it was and then he never came back he yes, very very sadly died he was I don't know he was about 50 young children and everything mm. gorgeous man but it meant that my character and my daughter in it um, we were his invention and mm. So they really didn't know what to do with us after that. They kind of played out the 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 the, the storylines he he set up before was that I was going to have an affair with my daughter's boyfriend, um, lovely Adam Thomas, and um, who actually I found out not that long ago. I remember him saying, "Oh, I've had a crush on you ever since Doctors," and I thought he must have seen a few episodes when he was a kid. Actually, no, he played my patient in in an episode of Doctors when he was about twelve. No um, way. And yeah, and somebody sent me a screenshot of us, and I thought, "Oh my God, do we actually?" And I sent it to Adam. I went, "I cannot believe." It. So when he said that, he said, "I had a crush on you." I said, "I didn't realize we'd actually work together." But anyway, you know, you know, sort of eight years later, we were snogging scenes and all that. Um, but yeah, he's adorable, as are so many of the people on that show. Really, really lovely. Um, but yeah, so we played out that storyline. We got a new producer who didn't actually stay long himself, but he, you know, their job is sort of like to to axe people and shake things around. And um, it, 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 as is often the case, it's sort of last in, first out. And so we'd only been in it, I don't know, about eight, nine months by then. And so... Mm had a meeting and he said unfortunately gonna have to we're, we're getting rid of your characters so so that was the end of Ella um uh, but it was a nice job it was a, a very strange time for me uh, my dad himself had um uh, been diagnosed with cancer and he died within three months so um so actually I, I, my memories of it are on the whole very sad uh, of my time there mm. um obviously you know being axed from a job and losing my dad was uh so so 
yeah, that whole time is kind of um, shrouded in a kind of sadness for me. But it was a great job. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, being so busy and it's very different to doctors in that with doctors, I think there were eight of us when we it was a, it was a very small mm. cast when we started. And then in Emmerdale, I think there was something like 80 cast. And so you bump no into way. people in the corridors or occasionally in the green room. But some of the cast you really you, you never really even met. Um, unless you had mm. seats with them. Occasionally in the wall pack, you'd see a few different people. But yeah, it was fun. And I love TV. I love screen work. I love being on stage as well. But I think uh, my preference is always um, uh, screen stuff. I love everything, yeah. all the technicalities, everything about it. And I like sticking my oar in, as you know, in filming. I'm always making useful suggestions. Um, you know, maybe yeah. if you do this, maybe if you put the light there, shall I hold this? Shall I carry <laughs> that? You know, um, yeah, I, I I I do like to get involved in in everything really. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So Emmerdale, yeah, lovely job. Very, I was very lucky, but uh, mixed feelings about it, you know, on the personal side. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and both of those roles, the Doctors and the Emmerdales, I'm assuming they didn't kill you off, did they? In those two? No, no, they didn't. Either of them, no. No. Um, even Ella, yeah, no, I, I, uh, mm. bombshell about my daughter not being, um, uh, my husband, uh, uh and mm. drove off in my <clears throat> very nice Land Rover or Range Rover or something. Mm -hmm. So they left it open, but then the rest, mm. no, no, nobody is still in it. You know, um, Jason Merrill's left a, a year or so later. And so there's no sort of connections really from, for me to go back. You never know, but I'm, you know, I'm not dead. Um, yeah. And in Doctors, um, they, because it was my choice to leave, stupidly, mm. but you know, again, if you think, oh, you know, this is going to be a launching board, I'm going to go off and, you know, be in movies or whatever. So, um, and at the time, I thought, well, you know, I've been in it, like, getting on for six years, it's a long time to be doing one job, I should be doing other things. Subsequently, people have stayed in it, it's just been axed, but, but I mean, there, there was a guy in it, Adrian, when I he joined about six months before I left, and he was still in it. I mean, he he did about eighteen years in the show or something. So why I was thinking that five years was a long time, I don't know. Anyway, I I asked to leave, um, and they brought back Tom's character, and then they wrote a lovely out for us both. He came back and whisked me off my feet, and we went off to Leeds, strangely enough, to set up our practice up there, and that's how they left it. And I was always hoping that they might bring us back at some point. But like I say, it's been, it's, uh, Doctors is no more. It's still on the telly at the moment, but um, I think the last episodes go out at Christmas or something. But they're not actually filming anymore. So you never know um, mm. if these, if people are watching it on the UK drama channel, let's yeah. hope for a reboot. Let's hope for yeah. some sort of refresh of it where they bring you guys back. That, that, that sounds great. That sounds um, so then... Yeah, sounds good to me. So if you could now go back in time and give yourself some advice for the mm -hmm. beginning of your acting career, what would it be? My advice would have been to do it earlier, <laughs> to have bitten the bullet and bloody just gone for it when I was younger, because <clears throat> obviously by the time I, I was 30, I was 31, didn't tell anybody at the time. I think I told everybody I was 27 or 28 when I left drama school, but in, in reality, I think I was 31. So by that time, you know, I was mm. too old for my Juliet, wasn't I? You know, in so many roles. And especially as a woman, you know, sadly, uh, well, for anybody that's sort of a, a over 40, but for a woman, really, you know, it, it, it's, it does get tougher and tougher. Um, so, yeah, I think I just wish I had had the courage to just go for it earlier. But then on the other hand, um, I was terribly shy. I had no experience in anything. Um, and so maybe if I'd have tried tried it earlier, maybe it wouldn't have worked. Maybe I wouldn't have got into drama school. Maybe even if I had, mm. um, I didn't have the life experience, um, which I think helps enormously. Um, yeah, I mean, but what's the point of saying what ifs, really? Um, I did it when I did it, and it, and it worked out. Uh, but... Mm. Um, Sorry, that I just got an email. To... That's all right. <clears throat> it's probably a job offer. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> doctors. The rebooting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that would that. I think that would be my advice. Um, 
yeah i don't i don't know it's but this isn't very useful is it to to your listeners apart from no that's no it's interesting that's um start it, uh sort of biting the bullet going for it earlier i think uh people who want to be performers might assume oh i've got to be gregarious and outgoing and have loads of confidence to do that role but it's yeah. nice to hear that you've mm. come from someone who's not not necessarily had that confidence yeah. um and i know speaking to a lot of people who act they are maybe a bit more withdrawn when they're not in front of the camera or on stage they sort of save that version of themselves for performing um yeah. so that they're not on the whole time i think you're absolutely right yeah i tend to um I, there are some people that are showy offy by nature. Um, I'm mm. certainly not, and I think a lot, like you say, a lot of actors aren't. Um, you know, it, it's there, there's a lot of incredibly shy actors, and I think the reason that we go into this profession is that we adopt. We it's not us on camera. Um, it, we're playing a, a role, and that's why things like this are so much more difficult for us because we are being us. Um, but although I'm playing a more confident version of myself at the moment, <laughs> obviously, um, but but um, yeah, I think that's why why we do it because you know um, I played Helena in 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 um, the Apocalypse Box. Um, she wasn't me, and so you know when you got me to do some really goofy things um, and wear some really uh, odd things, I think it's not me; it's my character. Um, so. Mm. Yeah, it does annoy me actually when when um, when actors you know object to certain things. Where you think, well, it's not you. It, you know, it, it is the character. You you know, it's it's not you. Yeah, it's embarrassing, but it's not you that's embarrassed. It's the character that's embarrassed. Um, hmm. Yeah, so no, it's a wonderful excuse to to do loads of things that you wouldn't normally do, and you know, um, just adopt a character. Um, but yeah, I think being being reserved actually can be can be an advantage somehow but I do I've always looked at even when I was a kid I used to look at showy offy kids and be a bit like Ugh. but also a little part of me is a little bit jealous that 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 abandon just like I don't don't care what people think mm. but then I can't help thinking they do care what people think they just think they're so amazing that you know I should share this with yeah. the world because I'm just brilliant and that you know yeah they're not <laughs> yeah I yeah, I think um, having been to a lot of networking things and spoken to a lot of people, I tend to gravitate to the people who are quieter and maybe just want to chill and chat and not show offy. Yeah. Uh, because you find more depth there, you find more interesting conversations and stuff. So I want you to tell me about the Apocalypse Box. Um, I play Helena Stonesmith, who is the wife of the prospective Prime Minister, Piers. Um, she... She's a bit of a sad, pathetic character, really. And I think she's a bit of a Liz Truss, but a likable Liz Truss. A Liz Truss that um, is actually got a soul and a sense of humour. And over, over everything else, she is a woman full of love, um, blinding love for her husband. Tell me why people should watch The Apocalypse Box. You should watch The Apocalypse Box because it's um, a film that is full of suspense. You never know where it's leading. It's got a lot of twists and turns and you think, oh, oh, it's going this. Oh, no, it's not going that way. Um, it's um, It's got some horrific moments in it, brilliantly put together by our uh, director. Uh, it's got some fantastic performances in it. And I'm not just talking about myself. Um, and it's also very prescient and very much uh, something to watch at the moment. Not only have we just had our own election, which, thank God, went the right way, as far as I'm concerned, um, but also with what's going on in the States uh, and, and Trump. It's, uh, um, it's got a very uneasy sense of foreboding <laughs> about the whole thing. So, yeah, it's, um, if you want to jump, if you want to be shocked, if you want to just go on a crazy uh, roller coaster ride, watch the apocalypse box. You won't regret it. 
I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like to hear from more industry professionals, how they got into the business and how you can do the same, or you just want to listen to some cool stories from movie sets around the world, then please do subscribe to the Honest Filmmaker podcast. Thank you.